My name is Ronald Hirano. I was born in Berkeley, California, and I attended the California School for the Deaf at Berkeley. I graduated from Gallaudet College with an AA degree in 1955. I returned to California and furthered my education, studying to become an architectural engineer. I took classes without interpreter services. A classmate agreed to serve as note taker, taking notes for me during class. I then went to work for a company that manufactured architectural products. I taught at Ohlone College, which is located in Fremont, teaching American Sign Language, math, and backpacking. When the budget was cut, my teaching position ended. But I was offered a job in Texas, teaching at SWID, S-W-C-I-D, which stands for the Southwest Collegiate Institute for the Deaf at Big Springs, Texas. I decided that I would try it, but wound up returning to California, going back to my old job, and working there until I retired three years ago. I may be retired, but I still keep busy. As I was growing up at the School for the Deaf, one of the activities that had an effect on me was the Boy Scouts. I was active in the Boy Scouts, even attaining the rank of Eagle Scout. When I started working, I wanted to learn more about camping and backpacking, and a friend of mine recommended that I check out the Sierra Club. So I did. I became involved, and they were hosting a training on backpacking and camping. I was the only deaf person in the group, but they agreed to write to me, and so I was able to learn about camping and rock climbing. And when the training was over, I set up my own group for the deaf, which I led for 15 years. Training individuals on how to camp during the wintertime, cooking on the outdoors, rock climbing. And the trips that I would host would last anywhere from two, two and three days to a week. These activities led me to establish a retail operation, selling backpacking and camping, camping equipment. That venture progressed well, and many of the patrons who came to my store accepted my deafness and were willing to write, except for a couple who preferred going to my clerk and asking for assistance there. I found out later it was because these people were not fluent in writing English. While I was young, there was the forced evacuation of the Japanese, and buses were lined up at the Berkeley Church parking lot, and Miss Rice brought me there to say goodbye to my parents, to my family, as they were being relocated. And I had done something that time to insult my mother. I didn't know about this until many years later, when my sister shared this with me. After I got married and started earning some money, I started investing in some stocks. When the interest rate started to decline, that was the time to look for a house. And I was trying to save enough to make the down payment. I asked my father if I could loan, if I could borrow a thousand dollars. Behind the scenes, my mother had told my father not to loan me the money because of this, whatever I had done to insult her back in those days before camp, before the evacuation internment camp. But what I wound up doing was having to sell some stocks at a loss. I also found out later on that my father had loaned money to each of my siblings when they became, when they were buying their house, but he didn't loan any money to me. I did not find this out until much later when I became a trustee for his estate. As I was teaching, my father's health started to decline. And after my father passed away, we found that my father owned $11,000 in taxes to the IRS. My sister suggested that I go through his records and meet with the IRS to go through the tax forms. My mother signed over a power of attorney 
so that I could act on my mother's behalf. I was working during the week and on the weekends go to my mother's and where I went through all of my father's records, going through all of his papers. This took several months. My mother did pay me for my work. When it was time to make an appointment with the IRS, I informed them that I was deaf and I requested interpreter services. They said that they would provide an interpreter. On the day of the appointment, however, I got to the IRS office in Oakland where I was met by a very nice young woman and I found that there was no interpreter there. So I asked the IRS, uh, IRS representative if she would be willing to write to me and she was willing. We sat there at her computer, we laid out all the papers, she showed me the itemization that led to the $11,000 um, tax um, and I showed her the papers and we were able to get the $11,000 tax down to $900. When we got the taxes down to $900, that made my family very happy, and that in turn led me to setting up my own tax business. My father is an Issei, meaning that he was born in Japan and immigrated to the United States at the age of four. My mother was a Kibe, meaning that she was born in the U.S., but at the age of 14 or so, moved to Japan for her education and then returned to the U.S. My father is fluent in spoken Japanese but cannot read or write. My mother can both speak, read, and write the language. So often, if my father got any correspondence in Japanese, written Japanese, my mother would translate for him. My grandmother could not speak English. She spoke Japanese. And she did not become an American citizen until after World War II, when the laws changed and became more flexible. At home, as we were growing up, we had Japanese food occasionally. Most of the time we had American food. My parents mostly ate Japanese food. I remember as I was growing up, watching my father. Every day, he would polish his samurai sword that was hanging on the wall. Every day, that was his ritual. And I enjoyed watching him do that until the evacuation of the Japanese Americans when the FBI confiscated the samurai sword and never returned it. Also when I was young, I remember watching my mother play the koto. The koto is a musical instrument similar to a harp and I used to enjoy watching her perform for the church. My parents were active in the Japanese American Methodist Church in West Oakland. One time, my uh, parents decided that they were going to put me in the church choir, much to my astonishment because I couldn't sing. So what I had to do was learn how to move my mouth. It was a very uncomfortable feeling. And yes, the church was composed all of Japanese American worshipers. My siblings speak and understand Japanese, but I don't. Um, in Japanese culture, to say no is a shake of the hand. And that's part of the Japanese tradition. If we want to say that something was good, we would pat ourselves on the cheek. Then the patting on the cheek to indicate that the food was good is more of a home sign than a Japanese, um, Japanese gesture. My father was one of the guinea pigs chosen by the University of California at Berkeley to study heart disease in Japanese Americans living in America and comparing that incidence with Japanese Americans living in Hawaii compared to a third group, Japanese living in Japan. And the research findings demonstrated that those Japanese Americans living in California had the highest incidence of heart disease because of the consumption of red meat. Those Japanese Americans living in Hawaii 
had less of an incidence because their diet had more fish in it. The lowest incidence of heart disease was found in Japanese living in Japan because their diet is mostly fish, very little red meat. I was born deaf. My brother was born hard of hearing. My parents panicked, didn't know what to do, so they sought the counsel of a doctor. And the doctor recommended a person who was involved with deafness. Her name was Miss Delight Rice. My father went to see Miss Rice. And upon Miss Rice's recommendation, I was placed at the California School for the Deaf in Berkeley. And my brother was placed at an oral school, an oral program in San Francisco called the Golf School. My brother and I, though, as we were growing up, signed to each other. On the morning of the Pearl Harbor attack, December 7th, 1941, I was seated in the kitchen, and I saw my father with his ear to the radio. There was no television back in those days, and I could see my father's facial expression change from anger to tears, and I could not communicate with them, so I didn't know what he was reacting to. The next day, I saw the headlines on the newspaper talking about the Pearl Harbor attack, and so I understood better. My father was worried, or, or rather I should say that the U.S. government issued an executive order forcing an evacuation of the Japanese Americans from the West Coast, California, Washington, Oregon, to put them in, turn to put them in internment camps. The government, the U.S. government, felt that the West Coast was a strategic and vital area. They wanted to move the Japanese Americans inland thinking that the coast would be vulnerable to attack by the Japanese military forces and that the Japanese Americans might aid the Japanese forces. If I were to be placed in the internment camp, my education would stop, and my father was worried about that. So he asked Miss Rice if she would be willing to take care of me while the family was in camp. He then went to the FBI seeking permission. The FBI granted permission, and so I was able to stay with Miss Rice during the war. I'd like to talk about my family. On my mother's side, my grandfather immigrated from an area of Japan that I'm not really familiar with. I don't remember the name. But they settled in San Francisco. And my grandfather worked as a laborer. And when it was time for him to seek a bride, contacted his relatives in Japan and received a group of pictures from which he chose his picture bride. She came to the U.S. and they were married. His earnings he gave to my mother, who used the money to invest in properties around the San Francisco area. My father came to the U.S. at the age of four. My grandfather owned a hand laundry which was located in Oakland, which was located in Oakland, California. My father met my mother at a Japanese American church activity. They were married, and my father was a hot salesman in Japantown, and he became very successful. When he had saved enough money, he invested in a supermarket in Oakland. Later on, my uncle purchased another supermarket in East Oakland. When my father felt the time was right, he sold his business. The very next day was the attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. My father was fortunate. The local 
residents of Japantown started a rumor thinking that my father was a spy. He was not. That thinking occurred because he had sold his business right before the Pearl Harbor attack and did not lose money in the venture. My uncle, however, lost a lot of money because of the war. My experiences as a Japanese-American student at the Residential School for the Deaf. While Miss Rice took care of me, I commuted back and forth to the school. I was the object of taunts and barbs from other students. Even the teachers and supervisors would call names. And I would look at them to see what their ancestry was. And you could tell by their last name what their ethnicity was. And if they were Italian or German, I would talk back to them. And I would say, your ancestors, your family, is involved in the war as, as well. So I would talk back to them. And that got them quiet. Even my supervisors would call me Jap. I suffered a lot in those days. Outside in the community, the people in the community were very hostile to me. They would hit me on the back of the head. And the FBI had given me a special card, a pass card, so that in the event that I was detained by the police or other authorities, I had to show this pass card. Miss Rice took me to visit my parents at the assembly center. It was a temporary holding place because once the forced evacuation order came out, the internment camps weren't ready. So they would use county fair facilities or horse race tracks as a temporary place as the permanent camps, as the permanent relocation camps were being constructed. So Miss Rice took me to the San Bernardino Assembly Center and I went to see my parents. I was about 10 years old at the time and I was shocked to see their conditions. My, my family was sleeping in a horse stall. They introduced me to a young deaf man and I recognized him as someone who had been active in the local Oakland club. And my father said that he had been giving him clothes and other necessities. I asked why. And this young, ex young man explained to me that he had been living in an apartment in Oakland and had known nothing about the executive order, the evacuation order, until one day the police raided his apartment, the FBI rather, raided his apartment and took him under custody, not giving him any time to pack any of his belongings. So he was very much taken aback. So my my parents shared with him the things that he needed. I'd like to talk a little bit about my the differences between Asian culture and mainstream culture. When I was at Gallaudet back in the 1950s, I entered as a prep, and the practice of Gallaudet at that time was hazing, where the upperclassmen would order the lowerclassmen about. But they never bothered me, I and my friend who had grown up together. They never ordered me about, and I never understood why. One day, the upperclassmen admitted that they had been afraid of what they thought was my prowess in karate, and they did not want that to be used against them. So that's why didn't, they didn't subject me to the hazing of the others. Another incident revolved around Chinese food. On the East Coast, there was a negative reaction to Chinese food. There was a misconception that um, if people did not like food, they would discard it and give it to the pigs. And if the pigs didn't like it, that was then Chinese food. And when I heard that, I was very insulted. So I told my friend that, that Chinese food was really quite good, and they didn't believe me. So I made a bet with them, and I said, well, let's go to Chinatown. And if you do not like the Chinese food, then I will pay the entire bill. If you like the food, then you pay for your own dinner. And there were about 12 or so who joined me 
going out to the Peking restaurant, which is a very nice restaurant on Connecticut Avenue in Northwest Washington. And we sat around the table. Before I placed the order, I asked the members of the group which dishes they did not like. Most of them did not like fish. So when I placed the order, I made sure that there were no fish dishes included. And the food came about, and one of my friends said, see, I told you it was trash. And I said, no, try it. So everybody took a taste, and one taste led to another, and they wound up liking it. And after that, they came to me looking for recommendations on Chinese dishes. I was a student at Gallaudet during the time of, during the days of segregation. And uh, a Chinese student had gone to a water fountain and asked me whether I drank from the water fountain for whites or for coloreds. And I said that I drank from the white water fountain. So that was something that uh, he learned. I remember going out <clears throat> one day to a restaurant. There were a group of us. And I had a black friend with me. And the restaurant would not let us in because of the black student. So we decided to order out and to eat outside because we did not want to leave my friend outside. There was another time where we went for, we went to one place for a class picnic and there was a sign that said no blacks allowed. So what we did was my friends and I surrounded our black friend and got him into the picnic unobtrusively. They did not notice he was coming in and likewise they did not notice him as we hid him as we left. There was once when I took a bus from New Orleans to Corpus Christi, Texas. At that time, the back of the bus was reserved for blacks, and the, white, the front of the bus was reserved for whites. Another white friend of mine got in. The front part of the bus was full, standing room only, but there were seats in the back of the bus. So I asked my friend if he would want to sit with me in the back of the bus, and he said fine, and we sat in the back of the bus, and it was okay. Now, if a black person <coughs> had uh, tried to stand or tried to sit in the front of the bus, he would have gotten attacked, but people left us alone. While I was teaching at SWID, the, th the Southwest Collegiate Institute for the Deaf, at Big Springs, Texas, I was teaching engineering to five students from Iran. This was back in the days of the Iran hostage crisis, when Iran had taken custody of the Americans in Iran. And those five Iranian students had gotten quite a bit of taunting from other students, and so they came to me seeking advice. And I said, you're lucky, you are at least free. During World War II, my people were put into internment camps, so you shouldn't complain. And that got them quiet. I'd like to talk about my experiences with interpreters. The, I've worked with interpreters at school and at work and in family meetings and also at meetings of senior citizens. I had never worked with an interpreter in an educational setting until the 1970s. And when I got an interpreter in the classroom, I was so excited because that made learning so much more comfortable. And there was one interpreter at that time, one interpreter who did all the classes. Now we see a team of two interpreters working. But I enjoyed having an interpreter in class. Another experience was when I got called for jury duty. Oh, let me say that before this jury du duty service, I had gotten a notice but I was waived. I was excused from having to serve on jury duty because that was the practice of the courts. But then in the 1980s, the practice changed. So when I received this notice, I reported to jury duty, and there was an interpreter there. We met, and I was familiar with this interpreter.
I was chosen for a jury. And in that instance, the interpreter was available for two to three days, but could not stay for longer than that if the trial were to have lasted longer. And I realized that the interpreter had even more authority than the judge because that interpreter was working all by herself. There was no one to switch off with. So when the interpreter would get tired, she would ask the judge for a recess, and the judge granted that. Granted it. I was shocked. The case was about drunk driving. And um, I remember that during the course of the trial, the judge emphasized, instructed us to look at the evidence without bias that we were to focus only on the facts, only on the evidence. And this was the point that he made to us repeatedly. Now, prior to the case beginning, during the voir dire, the lawyers would ask, would, would ask us questions looking for potential biases. And those who had biases were, were, struck and, were struck from becoming potential jurors for this case. So, in the back of my mind, as the jury began deliberating on the verdict, I remember the judge instructing us to look only at the evidence. There was one person on our jury who made some comments about the police officer lying and made that comment over and over again, and then the rest of us just sort of nodded our head. But in the back of my mind, I remembered the, the judge's instruction. And after a while, I got really angry, angry enough to the point where I stood up and I said, enough, enough is enough. The judge told us not to bring any of our own biases into this case. I was furious, and all of the other jurors looked at me in agreement. So when it came time to vote, this one person insisted on his, his decision, and the rest of us chose another way. So there was no agreement within the jury. It was supposed to have been a unanimous decision, and we did not have one. Another experience with interpreters was at work. The company had passed out information about um, the profit sharing plan and the changes in the market. And I remember getting one of the releases, one of the marketing reports, and I had gone up to a couple of my colleagues who had been learning signs, you know, the dirty signs, and I pointed to the market report and I, I uh, kind of gestured that this stinks, this is bad. Well, word somehow got out to the company president of my opinions, and um, he called me into his office, and he asked me if I would be interested in serving on the company investment on the company investment committee, and if so, they would pay for an interpreter. So I agreed, and it happened. There were times when the company president listened to us, the committee, but he also had his own advisors. So there were pros and cons of that situation. One of my other experiences working with an interpreter is with family meetings. I was appointed trustee of my family's business. And whenever we have meetings, there are three interpreters I like. They're top-notch interpreters. They're the best because they can read my signs, particularly when I sign quickly as discussions speed up. There are many interpreters who cannot read me. Now, I always tell my family that if a meeting is to be called, I need at least two weeks' notice so I can contact and get the interpreters that I want due to the heavy demand on interpreter services. But there are times when a meeting is called at the very last minute and I can't get my three preferred interpreters and I have to go with other interpreters who are not as skilled as the others. It can be a, a problem. There are times even during family meetings when the debate and the discussions become very heated and people start talking quickly and start talking over each other and then the interpreter will interrupt and say, please speak one at a time. And so my family does, and the logistics work out very well. I'm glad that you're learning to become interpreters. And what I would recommend is that you learn how to be particularly proficient in reading signs, especially fingerspelling. That's very important to focus 
and attend to the signs and finger spelling. Thank you.